I can't make up my mind. I don't know whether the magic words this morning are Dave Stevens and the Cyber Underground, or whether it's the great hack, that movie on, uh, on This Netflix. is an awesome movie. We can talk about that as much as you want. I love that. It was a great documentary, and it goes with uh, another uh, a great uh, Netflix special they had on Terms of Service, which, uh, you know, the two go hand in hand. If, yeah, you, yeah. if you click on yes for Terms of Service for that free email account, uh, you're clicking, you know, you're giving away your eternal soul. It's, if, I, if I had to think of a good title, I mean, I know we already have a title. What is the title? What is this? the title? <laughs> uh, watch out. They're stealing our brains. <laughs> you know, I don't think they're doing, I think they're installing a remote control. <laughs> okay. I, I think that's what's happening is we're, we're, we're being manipulated, you know, and I think, um, you know, just to kick this off, before we go into the deep dive of, of how they did it, I, I'd like to discuss why I think it's working. And one of the, the problems is, is the American culture is very short term. We're very short term thinkers. And we have this enormous wealth gap. And you'll notice that people that, and, and I lived this way, and I'm sure you did, when we were students and we were just starving, we thought about right here, right now. Well, how am I going to get through this week and tomorrow? Worry we'll about the future later. Yeah, the future is way in the future. We, I can't think about that now. Yeah. But that's half of America. That's more than half of America. Yeah. So if you convince them that something's wrong right now, right before the election, that's the way they're going to vote. Yeah. So I think 50% of America is thinking about how am I going to feed myself? And then they get the tweet, oh, cricket Hillary. And then I'm going to vote for the other person. Because the election's tomorrow, and I have to eat, and I, I can't don't have the time this. to investigate. I can't. I can't dig down. Twitter told me what's the facts. I got this news off of Facebook. I, I don't have time to go to the New York Times or the, you know, the Press Telegram or read a Canadian newspaper or God forbid Al Jazeera, and uh, and find out what's really going on. No, I'm just going to take. Yeah, I, you know, I have soft brains, and you can <laughs> you can enter my brains if you like. And let me take a minute just to talk about this this whole thing of the. Um, the dispute, I don't know if I really call it a dispute, between Facebook and Twitter on, um, you know, whether... Difference of opinion. Whether yeah. they should take ads uh, or not. Mm. And Twitter said we're not going to take ads, but that doesn't mean that you can't sign up and, and send false information to them all day. You can do misinformation still. You just can't uh, actually publicly declare we're putting a political ad on Twitter. Yeah, so but, what's the difference? Well, it's actually going to be pernicious watching. if you... If you say it in the name of news instead of in the name of an ad. It's actually a little bit better if you create what's called an online gang. You know, an online, what they call, quote unquote, grassroots movement. But it's actually a misinformation campaign to get people angry and against each other. And that anger causes the split second decision to vote for the wrong person. You know, at the outset, when we learned about... Uh... Cambridge Analytica and the IRA uh, research agency in Moscow and all that. Um, I was so impressed. I said, these guys understand mass social psychology, that they can figure out how to divide us and figure out how to activate these either kids or adults, if you like. This or is anybody. nothing new. This is PSYOPs. This has been around for 70 years. Yeah, and, and you and I could sit down and we could figure out, hey, what are the weak points in, in American you know, social structure? Sure. What are the things that people are concerned about? They don't need to be that concerned about it. They're a little concerned about it, you know, historically. And then we make a list. And it's, it's say a dozen things on there. No more than a dozen things. And then we figure out what to say to them to aggravate that division. You and I, in an hour, we could figure it out. So IRA wasn't that brilliant after all. They just understood the notion of figuring out you know, the, the divisions and then working the divisions with, I wouldn't say fake news, it's not really fake news, it's just, it's, it's at an angle, you know, it's, it's weighted, it's, it's tilted, and so it, it, it tends to exacerbate the division. It's not that hard. And these kids with the soft brains, they don't see it coming. <laughs> well, if, if you create, it's not just the, the divisiveness, if you create a threat to something somebody likes, their way of life, you create the threat of taking away your guns, people are going to vote the other way. Because uh, Beto O'Rourke says, hell yes, we're coming for your AR-15s. Well, I don't think he's going to get voted in, in Texas for anything anywhere soon after he said that. But that created the threat so people will vote against him. Now, you can create any kind of threat you want on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, Instagram. You, there's all these social media outlets that you can flood. But this is, again, it's nothing new. It's not just the Russians, but 
Cambridge Analytica figured out that they could gather 10,000 data points from every person on the planet. And they actually got 87 million Facebook users data from Facebook just by hooking up to their application programming interface or API. And they, they figured out all these data points. But it's not just Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica has an offshoot, another company that is their partner called SCL. They advised the Pentagon. They advised the CIA. Are you using past tense or current tense? No, well, Cambridge Analytica said they went out of business. But no, then, I don't believe that. Yeah, well, as, as, uh, as I've, I've known for many, many years here in Hawaii and experiencing it in my own family, when certain companies go out of business, they pop up as another named business. Whack-a-mole. Yeah, it's whack-a-mole, right? You can't, you can't get it anymore. But uh, Cambridge Analytica will pop up someplace else and keep advising the government because PSYOPs is huge. And when you add, you know, millions of data points, you push it all together, you come up with stuff you never expected. Yeah. And it's, it's not just one big massive group of people, it's little pockets of people that you have to get excited about something or yeah. make them feel threatened. We're all learning more about it, but Brad Pasquale is kind of a genius in this. Uh, he's the guy who was the um, IT director of, uh, social media director of Trump's campaign in 2016, and then he got elevated. He is now the over, he's, he can't be 35, maybe less. Um, he, he's the overall campaign manager for Trump in 2020. It shows you what Trump is doing, what Trump is thinking about. And it also shows you, and I'd like your view of this, okay. it also shows me anyway, that uh, this 2020 election is really all about social media. It's all about Brad Pasquale. And the way that Trump keeps that 40%, you know, his hardcore base is with social media. That's why they don't leave him because they're getting, you know, t twisted information all day long on the only channels they look at. Well, there's a reason they only look at those channels. And there's a lot of America that will only go and watch the news that they like, that agrees with their viewpoint. Fox News tends to do that. They speak to the base. They tell the base what they want to hear. They'll spin the story so people think, that's right, I knew that already. I'm positive that's happened. And now look, it's reinforced by Fox News. They don't want any dissenting opinions, so they're not going to turn on NBC, NPR, or all, any of the other stations. They don't get that breadth of news. So when they sign up for uh, connections on Facebook or Twitter, they're going to sign up for the people that they like and agree with. So the only news they get reinforces what they believe. And so it perpetuates itself. Yeah. Well, I mean, although there's uh, 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 what, MSNBC and CNN, you know, on, on network television that go after Trump every day, spend their entire broadcast time every day going <laughs> after. Um, fact is that NPR and PBS receive money from federal sources, and they got to be careful. Uh, they got to at least appear balanced. So what you have is a, a dearth of aggressive. Uh, news information services that will meet Fox News at the pass. And so I think Fox News, sometimes it just rules the day because the, um, you know, the, the Democratic side of things is, is um, a Marcus of Queensbury, you know, very gentle, relatively speaking. Right. Uh, they, don't, they don't lie. Uh, they don't, they don't go out of their way to uh, you know, make false statements. It's actual journalism. Yeah, they're practicing I mean, real practicing journalism. Real journalism. Fox News yeah. is not doing that. We're actually reliving a period of history, and I don't know if you've studied the, the early 20th century. Uh, we're, we're kind of reliving the teens and the 20s of, of the turn of the, of the 20th century when you know, yellow journalism was big back then. A newspaper could put whatever it wanted out there, and it saturated the neighborhood with the story. And sometimes it was the only publication out there, and people read it, and they believed it. It could be anything. It could be completely false, but they believed it. The moon is made of cheese. That, exactly. That could have, that could have flown just, just fine. And, and the papers that we have around now were practicing this yellow journalism, as, as they called it back then. But it slowly went away. I, I think we're slowly going to get out of this, but I don't see a path to that now. It's just so easy to lie and to manipulate, and we're making it easier to collect data on us because we like things for free on the World Wide Web. Right. We like to have free email. Right. We like to have free Facebook and free Google Docs. Uh, every time we sign up for things, there's TOS, Terms of Service. Now, if you really want to get a good night's sleep, read those. 
is you just go out like a light. It's, it's better than a sleeping pill. However, if you actually do get through that, you know, make a couple of passes at it. But if, when you read that, you're signing away your eternal soul. They say they will not use your data for anything other than just the purposes of that site. However, there's little provisions in there in the fine print, usually size 8 font, light gray at the end of the contract before the submit button, that tells you that if the government requests it, they're going to give them that data. And that without any, a subpoena. Without a subpoena. And here's how they can do that. You gave them your data. Therefore, you're no longer in possession. There's, therefore, you're giving up your privacy. Mm -hmm. You gave it to them. So if your social security number is in Google, guess what? If the government asks Google for your social security number, they're going to get it. Not that they need it. It's on the dark web anyway. I found my social security card out there. I took a selfie with it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, it, that came from another hack. But uh, Google and on Facebook have terms of service that say we will release if we're asked. Well, you know, here's a big question, and I, and I know you have a, a good answer for it. <laughs> people, people say, I don't care. I don't care. You can have my data. I have, quote, quote, nothing to nothing hide. To nothing hide. to hide. <laughs> but what they don't realize is... So here, let me give you an example of how that could hurt you, right? So say you're an avid Amazon shopper, and you shop, you do everything on Amazon. You buy all your clothes on Amazon. Well, uh, two years ago, the uh, Republican-led Congress proposed a bill to let medical insurance companies use your data from other online companies to... Uh, aggregate totals of, of risk for you and to adjust your rates accordingly just for you personally. So I'll give you an example of what came up. Someone said, well, what if I'm on Amazon.com and all the clothes I buy are plus sizes and I buy lots of candy and I got some cookies, right? And I buy lots of kitty treats. So now I'm a cat person. I probably stay at home a lot. I'm, I'm immobile. I'm huge. And I eat cookies a lot. My medical insurance rates are going to go up because I'm a greater risk for things like type 2 diabetes, right? That's, that's pernicious. <laughs> well, it, it's actually, it came to the floor of the house. Yeah. It got shot down, thank God, but it was on the floor. People were thinking about this. Medical insurance companies using your shopping data to make sure that you're not a high risk for them. Now, coming in from a business standpoint, brilliant. I'm reducing my risk, right? From a personal standpoint, I hate that. I hate people knowing that, okay, I like chocolate. Probably because your rates are going up? My, well, my rates went up 14% this last year. It was insane. In fact, um, the little raise I got at the university was overcome with the medical insurance uh, cost increase. So I'm actually making less money on my net take-home pay uh, paycheck this year than I was last year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is a sad case. But we haven't even touched exactly how you can use that in a, a kind of a psychosociological approach in politics. Mm. And right after this break, Dave, I'd like to talk about that because that is what's happening right now. Okay. I'm Duration. I'm the host of Finding Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. Think Tech Hawaii needs you. Please help us in our fall fund drive. Every dollar sustains us. Go to thinktechhawaii.com and click on the donate button. Or send your check to Think Tech Hawaii, 900 Fort Street Mall, Suite 888, Honolulu, 96813. Your donation is tax deductible and deeply appreciated. Thank you. Aloha, this is Rob Hack. My show is Exporting from Hawaii every other Thursday from 12 to 12.30 p.m. where I bring in People involved in the entire exporting infrastructure in Hawaii, including government, academia, and manufacturers and shippers themselves. Please join me every other Thursday, 12 to 12.30 p.m. on Exporting from Hawaii. Mahalo. Okay, bingo, we're back. This is so exciting. Dave Stevens and me, and we're talking about, we may change the title again, but we're talking about, watch out, they're stealing our brains. The, uh, the subtitle is because our brains are soft. And we let them steal our brains. So just go to politics for a minute. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this, this fellow, um, Pasquale, Brad Pasquale, is working on us right now. And he's working on the base right now. And he's holding the base. I'm sure he's got his kind of electronic you know, control room there somewhere in the, in the headquarters, probably in the White House, actually, using government money. Um, and uh, he's, he's working his base. 
their base. So the question is, um, you know, Cambridge Analytica is not out of business and getting uh, data on us, uh, including what we eat <laughs> and, and how many kitties we have, um, that's available still today. And they can get a profile on us. And it's brilliant the way they do that. A little data here, a little data there. You know, they know everything about us from stuff they can get or buy. Um, and if it's not Cambridge Analytica per se, it's the successor to Cambridge Analytica. And the IRA in Russia is all connected to that. So, uh, you know, to me, I think we're going to have a replay, sorry, of the 2016 election because of it and because of Brad. And so, you know, the, the question is, um, why do we let that happen? Why do we let that happen? Let me remind you that Congress hasn't done jack about this. Well, until just recently, we had a Republican-led Congress who was not motivated to do jack about this. Right? Just now, we have a, a House that is Democratic-led. Uh, we're still up against a, a Senate that is completely Republican. Pass it in both houses. It's it's going to not get vetoed. <laughs> right, and then it's got to get vetoed, and then you have to. Yeah, you know, we can't get a bill through. Uh, the biggest problem is we weren't motivated, and the people who are now in office, there's a, a dearth of people that hold office in Congress now that actually understand what's going on. There's very few of the younger generation that actually realize that when you send a text to somebody, it's open, it's not encrypted, and anybody listening in on that frequency can decrypt that and, and, or decode that and read your text messages. Your cell phone isn't encrypted. If, if someone gets your cell phone, they can, I mean, that happened to, during Bill Clinton's time. That's how they got the well, whole sure. Monica Lewinsky yeah, yeah, thing, right? Yeah, they were yeah. tapping the frequency for the cell phone. This stuff isn't private. And I, I think- and it can be aggregated. It can be Huge aggregated. Huge amounts of data. That's right. And I don't think Congress or the people that hold congressional seats right now actually understand this in depth. If they did, they Well, they don't they know how to know. frame a question to Mark Zuckerberg. They really did not. I, I watched those questions, and I, and I saw the expression on Mark Zuckerberg's face, and, and every once in a while, he pulled what I called the Scooby. The, oh, you know, what did you just ask? Uh, was that a real question? <laughs> Do you understand what you just asked me? And, and, and I did the same thing. Oh, uh, that's just, hey, Shaggy. <laughs> what, what was that? If they actually understood um, how people feed data, and, and put up profiles and put up every little piece of their day, what they're doing, what they're eating, who they're dating, uh, what their relationship status is, where, where, where they live, where they went to school, what classes they took. Um, I, <laughs> I had to demonstrate to some of my students uh, how easy this was. There was students in my class and I just picked a random name in the class and I typed her name into Twitter and her account was completely public. And one of her tweets about five minutes before I, I typed in her name was, this class is really boring. And there was a picture of me. <laughs> so I put it up on the screen and she, and she was really embarrassed. I said, look, you, you, you put public, this man. up there. This is public. <laughs> and not only that, it's forever. Nobody's going to delete this. And even if they did, it's in so many places now, it propagates. You yeah. can't erase yourself. And that can be used by... These people like Brad Pascal. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, and I'm sure that AI is involved in the analysis. It's the analysis that's the frontier. It's the brilliance is in the analysis. So I give, a, I give you a picture, a picture mm. of Dave Stevens. I know everything about you. I know what you do. I know as much about your, you know, you know activities, your behavior, your conduct, your situation in life as you do. Okay. And then I take AI and I compare that profile against other profiles. I say, gee, he sounds like he'd be soft on immigration. Let's go after him on immigration. He sounds like he'd be soft on, you know, a tax, re a tax reform reduction, bad reduction. Um, he sounds like he'd be soft on, on um, you know, the Middle East, whatever it is. Okay, and, and then, you know, they can, they can get you uh, with a soft brain, and they can, you know, use that information, use your profile in order to send you messaging where they're pretty sure it's going to have the intended effect. That's the scary part. So one little data point doesn't mean too much. But when you, you take a whole composite and then you compare it with AI against a composite, say, for somebody who doesn't like immigration, you can really do stuff. You really can. And the way they do it is they create fake accounts on Facebook and Twitter, and then they, they like you or they friend you. And if you're not paying attention, you accept it. And even on Facebook, by the way, if I accept your invitation to be your friend, but your settings are friends of friends and my setting is friends of friends. Now, everybody related to you and Facebook can see everything of me. 
because I've just opened it up to friends of friends. I got to set it to just friends, but the default is everybody, friends of friends. So if you see me, all your friends can see me. So if you're hooked up to somebody who has a fake account, now they see me too. And I'll get their posts in my feed. Right? That feed comes up all the time. I get new posts. They can post those things that will push me on the AI identified data points that they think I'm soft on, or maybe it's immigration or a tax cut, which I'd love. And, and they, they just push those ads. Hey, if you want a tax cut, this guy or you know, here, you could vote for him, and he's really big on tax cuts. Right. You're and a target. I'm a target. That's right. So, you know, how in the world do we stop this? I mean, it's not so simple as, uh, as agreeing not to put an ad on, uh, because you can get around that, as we discussed. Um, it's not so simple as saying, uh, I've asked you this question before, no more anonymous. I want to know everybody who's on the web. That's not necessarily direct, directly related, but you know, make it transparent so that you know. One of my ideas is if you post something on the net, we have to know who, who you are. We're going to give you a rating. And if you lie, you get a low rating. Oh, yeah, China you know. does that. Yeah. China yeah, has oh, a social yeah, score a social, now, right? right? And if you don't have yeah. a high enough social score, you can't even take the train. Yeah. Uh, I, I would argue, though, that there's ways around that. As you know, I teach ethical hacking. So I can be dozens of people on the web and, quote, unquote, prove my identity in a dozen different ways, and you'd never know. And right. that's what people did. That's what IRA does for Russia. They have multiple accounts per person. Some persons can handle 100 different fake accounts and post all kinds of information that will manipulate us to go one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you require, you know, verification of the individual and you give everybody an I, a national ID card or something like that, that's scary on another level. It means some agency, maybe government, you know, knows, you know, knows where you live on every element. So anyway, the other thing is, what do we do? What do <laughs> this we reminds do? me of a combination of 1984 and Brave New World. It is indeed. <laughs> or it's, it's Orwellian society. Yeah. Did, did life create the Orwellian, or did Orwell create the society? Because it wasn't too long ago that he wrote the book. Yeah, it's, a, it's a chicken and the egg thing. It's, it kind of gives me the shivers. <laughs> so what do we do in, in Congress? What do we do to Zuckerberg? Because we haven't done anything to him. We haven't done anything to Twitter and the others. Um, although they're all consolidating now anyway. So, so that's a big thing. You bring up something very, very special. So uh, right around the yellow journalism time in the beginning of the 20th century, we also had uh, a president who was a trust buster. So he went up and broke up these big companies and said, no, 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 you have monopolies. You know, you say you don't, but just because you own 99.9% .9 of everything and this person has 0.01, you're still a monopoly, even though there's two vendors out there. Yeah. You're, you're a monopoly. So yeah. uh, when Twitter, or not Twitter, when Facebook took over Instagram and WhatsApp, people started raising an eyebrow. Oh, something's really big here. Amazon has done the same thing. They control not only Amazon, but their entire supply chain. So when people say, well, why aren't wages going up? Because the economy is booming. Well, it's because Places well, like Amazon, <laughs> they have the monopoly. They can control all the wages all the way down their supply chain. All yeah. their vendors yeah. have to go to them. Walmart does the same thing. Yeah. So is it time for Teddy Roosevelt? I would say so. That's my personal opinion. I would like more options out there. Once a, a company like Facebook it gets up into the hundreds of billions of dollars in value or Apple becomes trillions of dollars in value, it's time to throttle back a little bit. Google has now their parent company, Alphabet. And there is, if you looked at the amount of companies within there, Huge. they're doing brilliant stuff, don't get me wrong. However, if they all decided to go one way, they'd take half the planet with them. They used they, to have a slogan that says, uh, we, we do no evil. I gave it up. It's no longer the slogan. Uh, I'm not sure I ever heard that. Okay, <laughs> do no evil? Way back. Okay, it must have been way back. Anyway. So yeah, their, their, their first uh, business model was, uh, I think they were just going to create a search engine that didn't suck. That was their yeah. business plan in 1999 <laughs> to now. 20 years later, they own most of the You know, there'd be a, a carrot and a stick. How about this, Dave? So on the one hand, you know, you want to have the stick. You want to have Teddy Roosevelt. You want to break these companies up into multiple parts. You want to not let them consolidate this way. Consolidation is dangerous. You know, for example, the, the um, conservative radio shows all being acquired by the Sinclair Radio. And oh, so this Rupert Murdoch's. Uh, I don't know if it is. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Okay. Well, this, uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, when, when you have consolidation like that, it doesn't favor democracy at all. No. Uh, aside from the e e economics involved. 
So anyway, suppose I say, we're going to not only break you up, but we're also going to incentivize entrepreneurs, small ones, who compete with you. We want them to compete with you. And maybe some of them will come up with a, a better mousetrap than your mousetrap, and, and, and people will like them better, and, they, and won't be threatened by them. And maybe, and maybe the, the guys who come up, the new competitors, will say, we're not going to sell your data. We're not going to exchange your data. We're not going to release your data. It's, mm. it's, it belongs to you. Uh, and that would be competitive, at least for me, wouldn't it? That would be very utopian. I don't see that <laughs> happening in this capitalist society. Uh, money's going to talk. I'll give you an example. Uh, way back when, uh, Microsoft was, was booming, but a company came up and made uh, Skype. Skype was great. Remember Skype? About 06, 08, we were using Skype. And guess who bought them? Microsoft, because they didn't want to compete with them. And now it's all sucked up into Microsoft. That happens with people that make products. Their dream is to get bought out by someone bigger. Yeah. And, and the reason is, if I create a company and I have this great idea, I don't have any money, so I go to you, venture capitalist. I say, hey, if you give me $20 million, we can make this fantastic thing happen. And you say, great, sell it in five years and give me 20% profit. Because that's what you do. That's your mission. So I have to sell off in five years. Who am I going to sell it to? Someone who's going to give me that 20 million plus 20% plus whatever I want to take home, which is going to be another 20 sure. million. So money drives that. Yeah. So I don't think that's a fix. Yeah. But you know what it reminds me? I'm reading a book now about uh, Rockefeller, among other people. Uh, it's the Rachel Maddow book, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, she talks about Rockefeller, and she talks about how um, Teddy, Teddy came for him. Uh, he was an oil magnate with, you know, huge wealth at the top of the throw. He was worth, in those days, in those days, not even converted for current dollars, over $300 billion. Not bad, huh? When they say not rich bad. as Rockefeller, they're not kidding. That's like as, as rich as Keanu Reeves. So, <laughs> okay. So, that, so then they broke, it broke up, the, you know, the standard oil you know, monopoly right. into lots of different parts. Guess what? He made more money after that because he figured a way around it. Sure, so most of those little companies are actually part of mobile oil now. Yeah, right, same thing. So here we are at the end of our show, Dave. I, you know, it goes fast, doesn't it? <laughs> no, we ripped through that. <laughs> I have one more question for okay. you, and this is a hard one. I never uh, promised you a rose garden, Dave. Okay. okay, so here we are in the state of Hawaii. Legislature created a privacy commission. What is that for? A, a task force. What are you going to do? And, well, it's about a privacy <laughs> statute. California adopted a privacy statute, right. which it, it, it's yet to be seen how that's going to play out. Um, but, you know, uh, the people in this later are con you know, considering similar kinds of legislation to protect the privacy. And, and privacy means data. That's what it means. So my question to you is, what is your advice to the legislature and to this privacy task force on what the state can do? You know, Congress is kind of locked up right now, but what can the state do to protect privacy and ameliorate the risk for us? The consumer? Well, before they make a decision, I'd say go back in the past and see how things have developed from the very beginning. Because I think most of the people that are making decisions now have this much information. When there's this much information available, if you look at the past, you can start to forecast some of the future. So before you make a decision about how you're going to solve a problem, look at the entire problem. I think GDPR came out just a little bit too fast, the General Protection Data Rules for Great Britain. I think for the EU, that was a good thing, but people didn't look at the entire history of this. Otherwise, Brexit wouldn't have happened. Brexit still happened. And you know, the most popular search after Brexit happened on Google, the most popular search was, what's Brexit? <laughs> right, I remember that, yeah. yeah. And no one knew what Brexit was. <laughs> but Cambridge Analytica, through social media, manipulated everyone going that way because the privacy wasn't there. That data was being released, and Facebook was leading the way. So look at the whole problem, then make a choice. Right, and including the consequences. That's right. And, 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 and this, this brings me to my final point, which I like to advise everyone is, you know, this show with Dave Stevens and me covering these issues have been shown in DOE, in every school, in every college, in every <laughs> community college in the state. You know, we got we to gotta get the level of awareness up on these issues. Just send out the link. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Great to talk to you. Aloha. As always, aloha.